let me tell you, oh my friends, about this joy I'm living in. Let me take the mic, go on a test and fire. Pathway Kids. My name is Michaela and I'm going to read a story this morning for our lesson. That's one of my favorite springtime stories. It's about a little mouse named Mortimer and he learns that sometimes he has to be patient and wait and pray before things will start to grow. And sometimes that happens in our lives too, right? We have to wait and be patient because growing sometimes takes a long time. So the book I'm going to read is called Mortimer's First Garden. I hope you like it. Mortimer's First Garden. Little Mortimer Mouse looked outside. Brown, 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 he squeaked. Nothing but brown. Too dull, too drab, too dreary. Mortimer longed to see something green, anything green. At least I have these, he nibbled the shell off of one of three sunflower seeds he had saved. Nothing is as good as sunflower seeds, he said. Just then the big people came into the room and one of them said, Children, it's springtime. What time is that? Garden time, shouted the children. Munch, munch, munch. Mortimer nibbled his treat. What's a garden, he wondered. Do you all have your seeds? Yes. Mortimer perked up his ears. Seeds, he squeaked. Anything about seeds could be tasty. Mortimer nibbled the shell off of his second seed. Munch, munch, munch. Delicious. Everybody look at your seeds. They are small, but imagine we can put them in the dirt and with a little water and sunshine, they will grow, grow, grow. One small seed turns into many more seeds or vegetables. It's a springtime miracle. Mortimer giggled at the thought. I don't believe a word of it. Seeds are for eating. Who would throw a perfectly good food in the dirt? He picked up his last seed and looked at it. But what if the miracle's true, Mortimer wondered. Can one little seed turn into many? Let's go plant seeds and soon everything will be green. Green, thought Mortimer. That settled it. I will plant my sunflower seed, he said. Mortimer searched and searched for the right place. I need somewhere the sun will shine and somewhere I can get water. And then Mortimer saw it, the perfect spot. Mortimer dug and dug and dug. 
He held up his precious seed. It looked delicious, but Mortimer dropped the seed into the dirt anyway. I hope the miracle comes true, he said, patting the soil carefully around the seed. And then he found an acorn cap and lugged over capfuls of water from a small puddle of melted snow. Phew, gardening is hard work. Mortimer looked at his garden, nothing but brown dirt. He looked up. The sky was gray. We'll see, he said. In the morning, Mortimer woke up to pitter patter pat pat rain, groaned Mortimer. Out in his garden, he found brown, soggy dirt. Mortimer stomped his paw. Nothing. I knew the miracle wouldn't happen. I'm going to dig up my seed and eat it, Mortimer said. But then he stopped. Maybe some miracles take more time. He looked up at the sky and down to his seed. Please grow and turn green, he said. The next morning, Mortimer woke up to pitter patter pat pat. Oh no, rain again, he said. Outside, Mortimer found brown, soggy dirt. No, 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 squeaked Mortimer. This won't do. My seed will never grow. How much time do miracles take anyway, cried Mortimer. If I don't dig up my seed now, it might rot in all this rain. But a gentle, quiet voice said, wait. Who is that, whispered Mortimer. Wait, the voice said again. Only it wasn't just a voice, it was a feeling in Mortimer's heart. Suddenly, even though he was drenched with rain, Mortimer felt warm and protected. And then Mortimer knew the voice. Mortimer bowed his head. I will wait, God, but please make my seed grow. And Mortimer waited. On the third morning, Mortimer woke up to a light in his eye. Sunshine, bold and bright and beautiful. Mortimer scampered outside and found green. Where his seed had been buried, two tiny leaves poked up through the earth. Mortimer danced and pranced and skipped around and around the tiny plant. My garden, he cried, my miracle. Thank you, God. Then he stopped. His plant was so small. And what was that next to it? A weed. Mortimer plucked the weed and watered the baby plant. And every day after, Mortimer checked his garden. He weeded, he watered, and he waited and waited and waited. And in the summer warmth, the tiny seed continued to grow and grow and grow until one day in his garden, Mortimer found yellow. A giant sunflower had bloomed, bold and bright and beautiful, just like the sun. Up, up, up climbed Mortimer, down, down, down he looked. Mortimer felt as if he could see forever. My sunflower, cried Mortimer, it is a miracle. Thank you, God. Soon the sunflower was heavy with seeds. Hundreds of seeds, squeaked Mortimer, all from just one. I've never seen such a wonder. He plucked each of the seeds and lugged them home to store away. That night, Mortimer cozied down into a bed of seeds and smiled. He stretched and yawned. <sighs> Thank you, God, for my first garden, Mortimer said, looking at his bountiful pile. There were plenty of seeds to eat, plenty of seeds to plant next spring, and even a few to share. And please, God, Mortimer prayed, I wouldn't mind a friend to help me eat these. And then Mortimer fell fast asleep.
Good Morning Pathway Church. We are so thankful that you are tuning in with us this morning and I hope that you've had a wonderful week so far. I know a lot of kids over the last couple weeks have been on spring break. So if that's you and your household, I hope you've had a time to relax and refresh and recharge and enjoy some quality time as a family. Uh, before we get started with our service this morning, I just have a few short announcements on behalf of the church. So Pathway Women on Saturday, April 17th, that's this Saturday from 10 until 1, we are hosting our virtual overflowing women's conference. So if you've ever attended an overflowing conference in the past, this year will be a little bit different, but just as good. So there are churches across Canada that are hosting watch parties for this conference and Pathway Church is one of them. So if you would like to attend the women's conference, please buy your tickets ahead of time at overflowing.ca and you can email admin at pathwaychurch.ca if you'd like to attend the watch party and I'll send you the registration info and get you all the information that you need to attend. The second announcement is on May 29th, at the church, we will be hosting a prayer and evangelism training evening. There's still more details and information to come, but if you have any questions or if you want to know a little bit more about what that will look like, you can email Dan Lodvika at danroselodvika at hotmail.com. And now we're going to jump into our service. And over the next couple weeks, we are hearing from Pastor Rob. We're starting a new sermon series, and I'm really excited about this one. So he is going to take us through the book of Mark, and we're going to learn about the characteristics of Jesus. So about his authority, his compassion, his suffering for us. It's going to be a phenomenal series, and we're really excited to start that today. Uh, before we hear from Carl and Christina and the worship team, I'm just going to ask us to take a deep breath and be present, um, and I'm going to pray with us before we start our service. God, we thank you for technology. We thank you that in the midst of everything going on, we can still gather as a church uh, wherever we are gathering from. Lord, I thank you for this church body and this family that is so in love and on fire for you. God, would you give us stillness and peace this morning? Uh, there's lots going on around us, um, but God, I ask that your word speaks to us this morning through Pastor Rob, and that we can worship authentically to you. God, we love you, and we are so thankful for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.
In it. 
every eye that sees me Christ be all around me Good morning, Pathway Church. I get to preach to you this morning. It's an awesome privilege. I'm excited about it. You know, I won't tell you that this is take two. Uh, <laughs> behind the scenes peek at the curtain. Sometimes, you know, you make mistakes. And the beautiful thing about recording, like we are right now, is we could just get a do-over. So that's really fun. Shout out for praise, whether you're here at our watch party or in the comments somewhere saying, yes for do-overs, yes for version 2.0. That's really exciting. I have the privilege, as I mentioned, of preaching to you this morning, next week, and the week after. So for the rest of April, I get to preach, and that's really exciting to me. My sermon series I've decided to call The Best Man, and we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark, kind of doing like a, a Gospel of Mark survey as we kind of go through and look at the large themes of the Gospel of Mark. I used to be, or there's a time in my life, rather, where I was a summer camp counselor. And as part of being a summer camp counselor, I got to teach kids about Jesus and also make sure they didn't break too many rules. That doesn't always work out. But that was kind of part of my job. And as part of that job, I got to give kids Bibles that didn't have Bibles at home. Now, for some of you at home, that seems crazy. You've had a Bible in your house your entire life. You know that you can come to the church and get a free Bible if you wanted one. If you don't have a Bible at home and you're watching this, hey, shoot an email or say something in the comments and we'll get you a Bible. That's easy for us. But these kids that I often counseled didn't have Bibles. And when I'd give them a Bible, they'd look at this huge book <laughs> and say, so do I start at the beginning and they start reading Genesis and, and they're like, well, where do I go to learn about Jesus was often the question. And I would almost always point them to Mark because Mark has this incredible sense of pace. Mark's always got somewhere he's got to be. Like immediately something happens. Immediately something happens. Jesus is going from place to place to place. He's doing things, big things. He's doing little things. He's doing all sorts of things. Like Mark is just he just is trying to cram as many things as he can into his gospel in as little time as possible. And I tell you what, this morning, I'm feeling the same way. I might have overprepped, so I apologize. But nonetheless, Mark really, 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 really has this sense of urgency where he wants you, the reader, to understand that Jesus changes everything. 
And for my sermon series, which again is called The Best Man, we're going to be a little flexible with what we mean by the phrase the best man. In the next coming weeks, we'll be talking about how Jesus is the best man, not in terms of weddings, but just literally the best man and God. But we'll get into that later. But for this morning, for now, I do want you to be thinking about that term, the best man, in all the modern connotations we have, i.e., weddings. Now, my best man is till this, to, still to this day, pardon, one of my best friends. His name's Jake. Jake and I played lots of music together. We had successes together in bands. We had failures as bands, frustrations. We're practically brothers, um, you know, in the sense that we'd also get into fights. But I chose Jake as my best man. And so on the day of Sarah's wedding, or Sarah and my wedding, I was there too. <laughs> Although if you ask me, my memory's a bit loose on the details. So if you told me I wasn't there, I'd probably believe you. But on the day of my wedding, which, by the way, went by so fast that very little of it is still in here, I do remember this. And that was Jake's best man speech. And he goes up and he says, the first time I met Rob, I thought he was a jerk. Now, the wonderful thing about picking someone for your best man is you're choosing them because you have a good relationship with them and you know that they're going to tell you the truth. I was not expecting on my wedding day to be called a jerk. Now, he went on to explain that the first time he ever met me, he didn't really meet me. We were in a class together, English Literature 101, English 101 at Briarcrest College. And one day, the teacher was talking about... Um, uh, not Trotsky, uh, Dostoevsky. And she asked the class a question about Dostoevsky, and I answered it because I happened to know the answer. And she said, oh, you seem to know a little bit about Dostoevsky. And I said, yes, I do know a lot about Russian literature. Here's the thing, I don't know a lot about Russian literature. I wanted people to think I was smart. Now, not my proudest moment, not my best moment. I was 19 years old. I should have known better than to lie, but here we are. Jake, meanwhile, is in that class and says to himself in his head, wow, that guy is kind of a jerk. Now, long story short, <laughs> our friendship persevered. We became friends nonetheless, and I really appreciated that on my wedding day, he's telling the truth about me. And yes, he said lots of wonderful things about me too. That was the majority of his speech were really great things that he said about me, really lovely things about my loyalty and things like that. And I don't mean to brag or anything like that. But hearing a best man give you just the brutal, honest truth is jarring, but essential. That's part of his job as we prepare for this wedding, to be honest with the groom. John the Baptist is kind of like Jesus' best man in the sense that he is telling the truth about Jesus. He is making the way for Jesus to show up. So in, in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, we get this. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. So we're going to stop right there. The beginning of the good news, euangelion, the beginning of the gospel, of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of God. The term gospel is extremely familiar to the people that would have been reading Mark's gospel in its day. Uh, in the first century, the term gospel was often applied to the good news of Caesar, the good news of Rome. And the good news of Caesar was that Caesar was an earthly king. Well, actually, pardon me. They actually thought of him as a god in some cases. A god king who comes and through the might of the empire and his brilliance and the fact that the gods are with him is able to bring balance to the empire, is able to have victory over other empires or, and to be conquered and to make Rome itself strong, to make what it has plentiful. So that, that, that usage of Mark of this term, the gospel, the good news, and applying it to a lowly carpenter, to a lowly Jewish rabbi, would have been really uh, vibrant of an image. Because you have to bear in mind, while we as, as New Testament believers, while we as the church, when we get exposed to Jesus, think of him in all of the light of his miracles, in the light of his teachings, 
If someone was encountering the gospel of Mark for the first time, they would have only known Jesus, unless they experienced him firsthand, as just a, a poor rabbi, a homeless man who kind of paraded around for three years and was killed by the Romans. How is his story the good news? How is his story a story of victory and kingship? Well, we're going to find out as we go along. Continuing on reading Mark here. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all of the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by John in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message, after me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I, John the Baptist, baptize you with water, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So we have John the Baptist saying, hey, I have a mission here on this earth, but there is one who is coming who is even greater than myself. If you can ever have been in a situation in which you are, are leaving a job, you know, maybe you're moving on somewhere else, maybe you've been fired, would you often think of referring to the person who's replacing you as more powerful than you? You're not even worthy to stoop down and untie that person's shoes? Probably not. And yet, John is comfortable transitioning his earthly ministry, his earthly work, over to this person that's coming who is so powerful, who has so much authority that he's not worthy to tie their shoes? This is someone big. And we're not stopping to linger today about this baptism of Holy Spirit language. We'll get back to it for now. But just bear in mind, this is something really, really big. Continuing on, verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. So, no birth narrative here. Mark's got things to do. Here's the good news. Here's the guy who came to tell you the good news of the good news. <laughs> and here he is, Jesus himself. Verse 10. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, focus here, he saw heaven. Jesus saw heaven being torn open. And the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. The ripping, the tearing of the heavens. So there are times in the Bible where similar language is used. The opening of the heavens. For example, in Ezekiel, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. It is usually a sign that God is about to speak or act and that one will get a quick peek at God's purposes. But Mark does not use the word open, does he? Instead, he describes that the heavens are torn, schizo, as one might imagine a bolt of lightning tearing its fabric. So I have here a bag, right? Nice little bag. It's full of like little pom-poms. Luna loves playing with these, and, and Ben loves eating them. Um, probably shouldn't let him eat these. So this is a Ziploc bag, right? Meant to be open. So if I open this bag, no problem. We can just, you know, we can just, oh, now I'm going to challenge myself to close a Ziploc bag on camera. We can just close it, right? No problem. But if we were to, uh, you know, take this bag and rip it, this bag is no good. Something has changed about this bag. No matter what I do with it, it's probably not going to hold those pom-poms very well. I mean, I guess you could throw a lot of glue on it. Or you probably wouldn't throw glue on this. I mean, it probably wouldn't work. You get hot glue gun, but next thing you know, you're inhaling vapors and weird fumes, and that's not good for you. But there's this idea that the heavens have been rended open, have been torn open. Jesus being baptized, his, his birth, his incarnation, God himself becoming human, totally changes everything. The heavens cannot contain its kingdom anymore because the Son has come. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the same spirit, people, that has been described in Genesis as hovering over the primeval waters in the beginning of time. 
It now descends upon Jesus to liberate the earth from the stranglehold of chaos. And a voice unheard of for an age sounds forth, announcing a decision made long ago. That the voice that molded the world is now going to speak to us in the flesh. You can't put a lid on this anymore. We're going to pick up our feet a little bit and move along to look at what this Jesus does. What has changed. So verse, or sorry, chapter 1, verse 21, we see the disciples and Jesus going to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority not as the teachers of the law. So just keep this in mind. How often in your life have you been amazed by a teaching? Maybe you come across like a science article or something on BuzzFeed and, and you learn new things and your mind is blown, right? That's one of like the kind of phrases that we use a lot, like mind blown when you discover this thing you didn't know. Like, Mr. Rogers is one of my heroes, okay? And, and that might make some of you laugh, but this man is, is, was truly a God-fearing, God-honoring man, and I respect him quite a bit. And this guy used to wake up and go for, like, hour-long swims, like at 5 a.m. in the morning. And after he was done swimming, he would spend an hour in prayer and in reading the Word and praying for his friends, his family, people who would come on his show. He would pray that people would know that they were loved by his ministry. That blows my mind. And we have Jesus going into the synagogues and teaching with such clarity, well, pardon me, not clarity, such authority and, and strength that the people said to themselves, we've never heard God talked about this way. So Jesus in his earthly ministry is able to have this verbal authority that people haven't encountered before, but it doesn't just stop at words. Verse 23 of chapter 1. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So imagine if we're sitting in, and this might be hard for some of you to imagine because it's been so long, but imagine if we're in our church service, you know, Jerry is preaching, or I'm preaching, or maybe the band is playing, and someone just starts screaming in the middle of our service. That would be jarring. But instead of screaming distractions, they're screaming the truth. Now, don't get me wrong. This spirit is described, as, we'll see, as we've seen, as impure. But yet, even this impure spirit that has possessed this person knows the truth. That Jesus is the Holy One of God. He is unique. The, uh, verse 26, the impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. The narrative reveals that Jesus pairs his teaching with mighty deeds. So there, in, in the literature of the day, there were rabbis and, and, and figures, holy figures, that would have done exorcisms, that maybe even did limited amounts of healings. But what's unique about Jesus here is that he pairs with them these deep teachings that even the people can point to and say, the scribes can't do this. The rabbis can't do this. And so both demons and religious authorities alike are threatened by Jesus. Everything has been changed. Heaven has been torn open. And they are not going to be closed again. In chapter 2, later on, we see the healing of the paralytic, where people say, hey, you can't forgive sins, Jesus. And Jesus says, not only can I forgive sins, I can heal this guy. And he does it. We're going to keep moving on here, but... I want you to realize that Jesus doesn't only speak with authority. He speaks with power also. In Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41, we read this. 
That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also boats with him. A furious squall, a furious storm came up, and the wall, uh, waves, pardon me, broke over the boat. So it was nearly swamped. Now, as I've mentioned in one of my sermons before, I can't swim. So if I'm putting myself in this situation, I am freaking out. <laughs> okay? Galilean fishing boats did not just have like handy rails that you could hold on to and just kind of like hang on for dear life. These are, these are small boats. And this is a furious storm. Verse 38. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. Um, another word here, uh, cushion is one way of saying it. It's kind of like where they kept the ballast, which would have kept the boat balanced. Um, so he's asleep is the important part. The disciples woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Which is a terrible way of asking someone to do you a favor. Verse 39, Jesus got up, rebuked the wind with his voice, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified <laughs> and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Ironically, the fishermen are the ones who are terrified by an unexpected storm. Right? Jesus meets the disciples and other gospels is recorded as saying, I will make you fishers of men. And yet it's Jesus, the carpenter, who sleeps Peacefully on a sandbag in the stern. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I just find that really funny. Um, so it, it tells you how bad the storm must have been if, like, lifelong fishermen are really deeply concerned about what's going to happen. So Jesus is very unique in the quantity of miracles attributed to him. There's no other figure in literary antiquity who is recorded as performing so many miracles. But particularly, Jesus has this like apparent ease and personal access to supernatural power that Jesus is that you know that no one else has had. Jesus uh, neither prays to God or uses a powerful name to perform his healings and exorcisms. His command is enough. This this aspect could be summed up as simply authority. So there, there's this thought in the world where, well, people will kind of be asked, what do you think about Jesus? What do you think about the religious figures? And they'll take a figure like, like uh, the Buddha, and they'll compare it to Jesus and say, well, they both taught good things. Many religions or people talk about Jesus as if he just did good things. He was a good teacher. But that is not the Bible's Jesus. The Bible's Jesus has extreme power, extreme authority, and extreme love. In all the midst of Jesus' many miracles and signs and teachings, there very much is this core of service for Jesus. In Mark 8, 27 to 31, we read this. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? And they, began, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. So they just kind of bring out the general list. You know, oh, well, they say you're this, you're this powerful person, you're that powerful person. And Jesus says, But what about you? And this is a command, this is for us too, I believe. Who do you say I am? Who do you, watching this at home, say Jesus is? Is he someone that you've kind of grown up hearing stories about but feel disconnected from? Is he someone that you've dedicated your life to? Is he someone who you're learning more about? And yet some of the claims that with the church and people who are in it make about him seem really foreign. Peter, one of his followers, says, you are the Messiah. Verse 30. Jesus warned them not to tell 
anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the son must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And after three days, rise again. So Jesus has his power. Jesus has authority, and he has a love that drives him to suffer for us. We're going to look more at this idea of a God who suffers for his created people. And he doesn't have to. Jesus doesn't have to suffer for us. But in the incarnation, we see that power and that authority for a moment, in a unique way, be put aside. He makes himself nothing. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, it says this, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption. The Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven, which has been torn open, and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So in the tearing open of the heavens, a new kingdom is declared, new in our experience. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is now coming into the earth. And what does that bring with it? Well, to know what the kingdom of heaven is, we look at the actions of Jesus like we've done this morning. That includes healings, that includes miraculous things, that includes love, freedom for the oppressed. That's what the kingdom of heaven is. That's what the king is bringing with him. That is what Jesus, in his ministry, in Mark, is bringing with him. So while John is the best man kind of witnessing to Jesus' arrival, as we saw at the beginning of Mark, Jesus should be our understanding of the best man. We'll look more at how this this humanity and this godliness are intertwined. And that's difficult to understand, but it's essential. When the crucified Jesus is called the image of the invisible God, the meaning is that this is God and God is like this. This is a reflection on what we've talked about today. That yes, we have a Jesus that the Bible tells us did many amazing things, but he did them for our sake. He did them to bring in a kingdom of heaven that has been brought into the world and has no going back. Pray with me. Dear God, you are good. We love you and you have done mighty things for us. Help us to run to your arms and into our personal ministries and to be effective in them. The heavens have been torn open and we live in this reality where we have been freed and sent to go with a powerful mission. Help us to embrace that. Amen. as nothing The King of all kings came to serve Washing my feet Covering me with your love If one of you means less of me Take everything Yes, all of you
In Mark, faith often leads to miracles. But the power does not come from the recipient's faith, but from the person of Jesus. Jesus is the revelation of God to us. His incarnation, the things that he did, aren't just appearances of God. It is God as he is in this incarnation. In next week's sermon, we'll be looking at this idea that in the suffering God, we can find comfort. We can find a Messiah and a Lord 
who is not foreign to our experiences. We have to hold that in mind with what we talked about today. That yes, God suffered by choice on our behalf. And yet he did it in a way that is powerful. In a way that is authoritative. At the end of Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, it says, For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him. And through Jesus, to reconcile all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We'll look deeper into that this coming week, but in this last week, and as I send you forward with a blessing, I encourage you with this, that with heaven being torn open, we get an opportunity to look at how powerful our God is. And I pray that this week it motivates you to take steps of faith in your life, to witness boldly and vulnerably also. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for church this morning. Thank you that your word can be spoken in public, that we can enjoy the freedom to worship you. That is not a guaranteed freedom. And so in this time, we hold it with open hands, recognizing that we need to serve God first. We need to honor you humbly, truthfully, We need to love you, God, and we need to love our neighbors as ourselves. Strengthen us to do that well. For we recognize that you have authority and you are our God. Amen. With all of my heart And I will praise you With all of my strength I will seek you All of my days And I will follow Follow all the I will give you all